in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And he said, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Again, the book of John. I love, I love this study that we've been doing the last few months. Good morning to you that are here. Good morning to you that are watching online. I've got some sisters that are watching online right now. Hi, girls, and praying for me. So thank you. I love you all so much. And we're going to be talking today about final words or last words or last instructions. And for those of you um, that are parents you know that there are different things that can really strike fear into your heart, especially of being a parent of a teenager. Uh, it might be their first date when they walk out the door and you panic. It might be the first time that you hand over those car keys and they drive off into the sunset and you just fear grips your heart. Like, are they gonna come back in a box or are they gonna come back in my car? Uh, it could be, well, actually, I think the by far the furthest gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching moment is when you watch your teen or your young adult pack up their car, pack up their belongings, and they're moving out on their own. They might be going to college, to a dorm. They might be um, moving in with a, a friend. They might be getting their own apartment. They may be going into marriage, whatever it is. But as a parent, you, you panic and you wonder, have I told them everything that they need to know? Uh, have I trained them well enough for success? Have I equipped them for what is ahead? They have no idea what they're getting into. Are they going to make it? And you know what they're going to face. And I was laughing because there's actually books written on this topic. And this book, it's called 1,001 things every teen should know before they leave home. Am I too loud? Do I sound? Am I okay? Okay. All right. Just making sure because I can be really loud. I'm Italian. So 1,001 things every teen should know before they leave home. Now, I've got to tell you, I am not endorsing this book in any way. It is not a Christian book. It is not doctrine or anything like that. It's more sayings, and there's some humorous things, some serious things, and there are some things that are spiritual things, but I just want to share a couple quick um, highlights out of the book with you. And I'm not picking on you teenagers, but maybe some of these things will help keep you from struggles down the road as you venture into adulthood, all right? So, a thousand and one things every teen should know before they leave home. They should know that adulthood is not for sissies, okay? Yeah. They should know that they're graduating into a world where employers get mad, dishwashers break, and money is hard to come by. All right? Oh, I'm getting an amen. They should know that everybody has days when the toilet backs up. God is not picking on you, okay? They should know that Bill Gates lost $40 billion in 18 months. Donald Trump declared bankruptcy and Michael Jordan couldn't make his high school basketball team. Things every teen should know before leaving home. They should know that in five years, they don't have to be the same person they are today. They could have earned a law degree, fed the hungry in Africa, or defended their country. They should know that if they make one person's life easier today, God will be pleased with their efforts, and they should start with their mom. 
Can I hear it? Amen. All right. They should know truly independent people don't scream that they're independent with their hand out. Ooh, okay. They should consider that, yes, as impossible as it may seem, they could be wrong. They should know to never believe emails. This kind of goes for us seniors, too. Never believe emails saying you just won a contest in Belgium that you never entered. Mm -hmm. This is for grown-ups, too. They should know to Google their name. See what pops up? Prospective employers will. Mm, okay. Things every teen should know before leaving home. They should know that they can live on what they make. They just can't live like they want to on what they make. That's a difference, right? They should know that sometimes life takes working two jobs. They should know that using a credit card in reality is taking out a short-term, very high interest loan. Mm-hmm, yeah, come on. <laughs> They should know that one of the proven keys to prosperity is giving back to God, even when there's not a lot to start with. That's good. That's good. Okay, this is, this is a heavy one that could go a million different directions. I'll let Holy Spirit take it where he wants to take it. You should know that if you can't invite God into the bedroom, it's no place for you either. If you can't invite God into your bedroom... It's no place for you either. Is that because it's a pigsty? Is that because of what you got on your computer? Is that because of who you have there? If you can't invite God, you shouldn't be there either. Anywhere that you can't invite God, right? Things every teen should know before leaving home. They should know that bleach is really, really good at making things white. And it makes everything white. Yeah? Even things that aren't supposed to be white. They should know who to call in case of emergency besides mom. They should know that if they don't eat their fiber now, they will be drinking Metamucil very soon. Yeah? Mm. They should know that their ability to eat 16 times a day, nap all afternoon without gaining an ounce, will disappear soon. This is what happened to your parents. Okay? It goes away. And then this is the last one. They should know to live their lives as an example. One day, they'll have kids. We don't think about that when we're teens, do we? One day we're going to have kids. We need to live life to be an example. So 1,001 things, instructions, every teen should have before they leave home. Well, today we're talking about the final instructions from Jesus and this morning, we're in John chapter 16. We're starting at verse 1. Jesus here is talking to his disciples, his students. Jesus is leaving. He's leaving. And he wants to make sure they understand the gravity and the seriousness of his absence. He wants to make sure they understand their assignment. And he wants to make sure that they're equipped with everything that they need, not just to succeed in this life, but he wants them to make it. He wants them to thrive, and he's giving them his final instructions. Let's pray. God, we have come to your house today because we are hungry. We are hungry for more of you. We're hungry for a deeper relationship with you. And Father, I ask that you bless the words that we read out of your scriptures that we will apply them to our lives. Holy Spirit, open our ears to hear what your Spirit would say to us as an individual. Help our eyes to be open to see what you want us to see. Shine your light in our hearts. And oh God, I beg of you that when we leave here today, we will leave here closer to you than when we walk through these doors, more committed to serve you than when we walked through these doors, more passionately in love with you than when we walked through these doors. In your sweet and precious name we pray, 
Amen. So if you've missed the last couple weeks, uh, the backstory leading up to where we are today in John 16, at this particular time, Jesus is with 11 of his disciples. They have had the Passover meal together. He has served them and washed their feet in response to their arguing who's going to be the greatest in his coming kingdom. He tells the disciples that he is going to be betrayed. And now Judas, the betrayer, has left the building. So now things get intimate. Now things get deep. And Jesus is so passionate and caring in this passage. They don't have a clue about what is going to happen and unfold in their lives and what's going to happen in history, even though Jesus has told them repeatedly over and over again. And in fairness, as we read these passages, we have the New Testament now. We have the whole Bible. They didn't know it, but they were living their lives and writing New Testament for all of us. So Jesus is telling them these things, and they just, they don't get it. They don't have a clue. But Jesus completely understands. His death is a few short hours away. His resurrection, days away. And some of the things that he's told them in this time, he said, I'm giving you a new commandment. I want you to love each other. I'm going away soon, but you can't go with me. But don't be troubled. Trust in God. I'm the only way to heaven, Jesus said. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, an advocate. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to abandon you. If you love me, you'll do what I tell you to do. You'll obey my commandments. And Jesus said, I'll come back to you again. He said, I'm preparing a place for you that where I go, you can be also with me. We can always be together forever. He said, if you remain in me, it's very important because apart from me, you can't do anything. And he said, don't be surprised, boys. Don't be surprised. The world hates me, so of course it's going to hate you. You belong to me. So that brings us up to the point in conversation today at chapter 16. If you'll grab your Bibles, read along with me in chapter 16 of the book of John, verse 1. And this is Jesus as he's continuing to talk. Jesus says, I've told you these things so that you would not be made to stumble. Now, maybe your translation says it this way. I've told you these things so that you will not abandon your faith. What things is Jesus talking about? Well, all the truths that he's already shared with them that we've talked about just now that can be found in chapters 14 and 15. We just reviewed these things. He told them all these things because he didn't want them to lose heart. He didn't want them to abandon their faith. Jesus doesn't want us to abandon our faith. And so in verse 2, he continues Jesus, and he says, They will put you out of the synagogues, so the places of worship. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they've not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you them. So he's saying, I'm telling you now, because he doesn't want them taken by surprise. Hard times were coming. And in verse 4, Jesus says, and these things I didn't say to you at the beginning because I was with you. There wasn't any reason to worry them ahead of time. He was waiting for the appropriate time. And again, he shows Jesus that he's thoughtful and considerate and loving. In verse 5, he says, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. So he acknowledges their grief, but they're too afraid to even ask him, Where are you even going? Verse 7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Eight times in this discourse, in these several last chapters of John, Jesus talks about leaving and being gone. Four times he talks about the Holy Spirit. 
and the purpose of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit will do when he comes. And Jesus says it's better if he goes away so Holy Spirit comes because some of the things that he'll do, he'll convict the world of sin. He will say what he's heard from God. He will tell about the future. He'll bring glory to God and Jesus. And there's so much more to the description of who the Holy Spirit is and what he does. So I'd really encourage you all to go home today and read John chapters 14 through 16 as the beautiful, cohesive conversation that it is so you can reinforce and tie all the pieces together and connect the dots. It's such a beautiful time that they had with Jesus. So now in verse 12, Jesus said, I still have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. There's so much more I want to tell you. Can you just feel the urgency in his voice and the anguish that he must have felt in his, in his heart? He knew time was short and he had to prepare them. And he says, there's so much more I want to tell you, but you just couldn't handle it. And it's like, I guess we would call it today like trying to drink from a fire hydrant. The water's coming at you gallons per second, but you can still only swallow one gulp at a time, right? So Jesus knew they couldn't take any more. But he says in verse 13, however, when Holy Spirit, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He won't speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he'll speak. And he will tell you the things to come. So Jesus is letting them know that they can't take what he has to tell them. But when he sends Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit's going to finish the job. And Holy Spirit's going to let them know what is happening in the future. So as you read the verses 16 through 32, he again tells them he's going away. He speaks about their coming sadness and their mourning and how their anguish is suddenly going to be turned to joy at his resurrection, and he talks to them about prayer and the Father's love. And then he tells them every last one of them will abandon him. Every last one. Oh, the kindness of God. He really does get us. This passage, again, shows that he's concerned about our well-being He's concerned about what we can handle. Page after page after page in the Bible, God shows us his heart. He cares about us. He knows we have limits. He knows we need guidance. He knows we are very likely to wander away from his path. So he warns and he prepares us. In verse 33, Jesus concludes this talk with two facts. So let's look at them and read them together. Verse 33, Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you. So take everything of the last two chapters, 14, 15, and now into 16. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you can have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He closes his conversation by telling them, you will have troubles. You will. But Jesus doesn't want them, and he doesn't want us to abandon our faith and to give up. And he said, I told you this also so you could have peace, that you could have peace. The world is going to be wrought with problems. It's a fact. He knows. But, he says, but take it to heart. Cheer up because I've overcome the world. This is not the end. So remember, he's telling them these things so they won't be afraid and to have peace when things get tough. He wants us to have peace in our trials. And I don't know, is it just me or does it seem to you too that big problems? I mean, not like I just got a tack in my food or something, but I mean big problems, like you're sailing along on the sea of life and all of a sudden the car engine blows up. It blows up. It's gone. The whole engine. 
the whole engine. And so you're just like, okay, you finally figure out the financial ramifications and how you're going to do this. And you get back up on your ship and you're going on the sea of life and then bammo, you bust your arm. And so now you're like, okay, now I'm not just financially reeling, I'm physically hurting as well as financially hurting. And okay, but just suck it up and you get back on your boat and you got your sails adjusted. And for just a moment, it seems like everything is okay. And then, ah, your sweet adored pet dies. And you're like, are you kidding me? How much? And sometimes it feels like we're in this ocean and we're going under the waves and we just barely get our head above the water and we get a gulp of air and we hold our breath just to be tugged back under again and hold our breath and go, oh, please, God, help me get back up to the top of the water because I got to breathe. Do you, am I the only one that feels like that or do you notice that? The problems just, they kind of come in waves. Well, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. And the longer that you walk with God and the closer that you walk with God, I have to tell you the problems don't get easier. They don't hurt any less. They don't. But you have the choice and you've learned that we can receive God's comfort and peace and strength. And prayerfully you've walked with him for so long that it's easy to trust him deeply why? Because he's been so faithful to you over and over and over again. Prayerfully, you've loved the Lord so long that abandoning your faith just isn't an option for you. And people that give up and people that walk away from God when things get difficult are, giving, are living for this life. And dear ones, the Bible is really clear on this. We're pilgrims. We are strangers. We are foreigners here, people. This world is not our home. This tent, when this tent dies, it's not the end of our story. It's just the beginning. And that is why it is so important for you to read the whole Bible. Because in the Old Testament, you read about a man named Abraham who was a foreigner and a traveler. And you'll read about Moses and the children of Israel who wandered through the desert. And this is a symbol of our life here on earth. This planet that they were foreigners just passing through. We are foreigners. We're just passing through. And the promised land, the place of blessing and rest, that was where they were heading to. That's what they had their eyes focused on. That was where they were heading. The forever promised land is heaven. And that's where we are heading. We need, need to live our life for forever. And yes, we have responsibilities. We have school. We have jobs. We have children to take care of. We have parents to assist. I, I get that. But while we're doing all that, we need to be determined to keep our eyes focused on where we're headed, not where we are. This world is not my home. We are pilgrims heading on our way to our permanent home, heaven. So I want you to hear this really closely. It broke my heart this week to hear from Trina that one of our junior high students in Santa Ana took her life this week. Kids and adults, I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear me hard. Hard times don't last forever. When you're in the middle of it, you think it's going to, but it passes. Ride out the wave, no matter how hard it is. Ride it out with Jesus. Hard times don't last. And when we have those hard times, God has promised to walk through those times with us. When we walk through the fire, he said, I will be with you. Zoe, when you think you're gonna drown and you're going under for that last time, the Father is with you in the water and he says, I am with you and I will take care of you, and he did. This is the God we serve. In the middle of your problems, you are not alone. He is with you. And Jesus said, I love this, hear me. He said, I am with you even till the end of time. Do you hear that? He is with us to the end of time. You can get through your problems. Don't abandon your faith. Jesus was very concerned 
that we would not abandon our faith. And this isn't the only passage where he shows how concerned he is. You can flip back to Revelation. John, the disciple that wrote this book that we've been studying, the book of John, also wrote the final book in the Bible, Revelation. It's a vision that he had from the Lord. And in this vision in chapter 2, he is talking, Jesus is talking to John and saying, write this down. These are messages I have for seven churches. Jesus didn't want them to abandon their faith. So Jesus, in Revelation 2, 2, he begins with, I know. And every message to every one of these churches begins with two words, I know. Jesus knows exactly where each church was. He knew the condition of every heart then, and he knows the condition of every heart now. He knows exactly what we are going through. So he says to this first church, I know your hard work and your patience, but you've lost your first love. They'd fallen far away from where they'd originally been with the Lord. And Jesus urges them, turn back. Do the works you did before. Repent. Jesus wants them to recommit to their faith. He wants them to come back. And family, we can be working hard and be doing all the right things and miss out on the love and relationship with Jesus. That's a sobering thought. But Jesus invites us, just like he was inviting that church, come back. Come back to your first love. In Revelation 2, 9 to the church in Smyrna, he says, I know you are suffering. I see your poverty. It's hard for you. And physically, you are poor. But spiritually, you are rich. Don't be afraid of what's coming, what you are about to suffer. Remain faithful, even when facing death. Jesus doesn't want them to abandon their faith. And dear ones, the news, conspiracy theories, the darkness of the times that we're living in, the prospect of what the future looks like for all of us can leave you crippled emotionally if we don't keep our eyes on Jesus. And he tells us, as he told this church, don't be afraid. He doesn't want us to abandon our faith. Jesus talks to the church in Pergamum in 2.13 and says, I know you live in the city where Satan rules, but you have remained loyal. It's hard. I know it's hard where you live, but you have allowed false teaching, encouraging serving idols, fake gods, and you engage in sexual sin. Jesus said, stop it. Repent. Turn around or I myself am personally going to come and fight against you. This is a big deal to God. And Jesus urges them to recommit to their faith. He knows that you and I live in California. He knows all that goes with it. He knows it's intense, but we cannot compromise on sexual purity. We can't compromise on God's definition of marriage. We can't embrace what God calls sin and then turn around and say, surely he doesn't mean that. Jesus wants us to recommit to our faith. In Revelation 2.19 to the church at Thyatira, he says, I know your love, your faith, your service, your, your patient endurance, your growth, but you are allowing an evil teacher, a woman who calls herself a prophet, who leads and teaches that it's okay to worship false gods. In other words, saying that Christ isn't the only way to, to eternity and to God. And she encourages them to commit sexual sin. Jesus said God gave her the opportunity to repent. He gave her the opportunity to repent, but she wasn't having any of it. She called her teaching deeper truths. Jesus called them the depths of Satan. Now, there's division in the church. Some of the church was embracing and following her evil teaching. Others were not having any part of it. And Jesus said he was coming against her and the ones who accepted her twisted teachings, and he was going to punish them. Now, to the people of the church who turned away from her teaching, he says, hang in there till I come. Don't give up. Jesus didn't want them to abandon their faith. And dear ones, you need to know the Bible. 
You need to know God's teachings you know of and I know of. I heard of a leader just this week, a hero in the faith, who once embraced the complete and entire truth and the purity of God's word, and now they've watered it down to fit culture, and they've twisted the truth of God into a lie. They might call it a deeper truth or an enlightenment, but Jesus calls it the depths of Satan. God's laws don't change to accommodate culture. Lying wasn't okay when God gave the Ten Commandments, and it's not okay now. Stealing wasn't okay when God gave the Ten Commandments, and it's not okay now. Turn away from false teaching. Hang on tightly to Jesus till he comes. Don't give up. Jesus doesn't want us to abandon our faith. In Revelation 3, 1, Jesus is talking to the church at Sardis and said, you think you're alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen the little bit that remains. The flicker of your wick of your candle is just about to go out. Your actions don't meet with God's requirements. He says, repent, change your ways, return to me. He urges them to come back to their faith. He doesn't want them, and he doesn't want us to abandon their faith. And this is why we need to spend time in prayer in the word. Ask Holy Spirit to show us in our own lives, what is there, Lord, that's good, that's right, that I need to build on? What is there, God, that's a mess that I need to get rid of? We need to go to God. And like this church, we need to be alive and vibrant and not abandon our faith. To the Church of Philadelphia, he says, I know you have little strength. They are being persecuted physically, and they were emotionally beat up. He says, you're weak, you're tired, but you have obeyed me, and you have not denied me. Hold on, he says, don't let any man take your prize or your crown. Jesus doesn't want them to abandon their faith. And aren't you touched by the compassion of Jesus here? I love it. He says, if you've come beat and struggling through trials, but you're still serving him and obeying, still walking the walk, he knows your strength today or your lack of it. Be comforted to know he sees your obedience. He takes note and he's telling you, hold on, hold on. Don't abandon your faith. And finally, he talks to the church in Laodicea. He says, I know. You do a lot of things, but you're void of relationship with me. You're simply going through the motions. You are rich and you think you have everything you need, but you're lost. You are spiritually bankrupt. You're spiritually blind and poor and naked, and you don't even know it. You're a hot mess, and you don't even understand it. He wants them to turn from their indifference and to recommit to him. And it's a sobering thing to realize you could be doing all the right things, feeding the hungry, taking care of the poor and the widow and the orphan, and still not be in right standing with God. Jesus doesn't want us to abandon our faith. And he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says that to all seven churches. He's saying, pay attention. Listen up. This is important. And every one of us need to take Christ's warnings to heart. We need to ask Holy Spirit to show us how we can be pleasing to him. And we also need to take Jesus' encouragement to heart. In Revelation, when you go home, read chapters 2 and 3. And this is what Jesus promises to every church, to every believer who stays true to him, who keep themselves from evil and obey. Listen to this. To eat from the tree of life, you're going to live forever. To be with God for eternity, people. A crown of life that will not be harmed, and we will not be harmed by the second death or eternity in hell. That's the second death. We'll miss that. Man of food from heaven, there will always be enough to eat. There will be no more hunger. He's going to give us a white stone with a new name. We get to rule and reign with Christ we will be given authority from God if we are victorious and we follow him and we obey his commandments. We will have fellowship with Jesus forever. We will be clothed in white, which is a symbol of purity and clean. 
He won't erase our names out of the book of life. He will announce us before God and his angels that we belong to him. He will protect us from the time of testing to come on the world, the great tribulation. We'll be pillars in God's temple. We will never have to leave his presence. God will put his name on us. We will have citizenship in heaven. The benefits of obedience so far outweigh any struggle, any persecution, any trial we could face on this earth. And Jesus is such an encourager. He does not want us to abandon the faith. So we go back to John 16, verse 33, the sandwich of Jesus' talk here in the Gospel of John. And he says, I've told you these things. You're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And if the worship team will come up. Jesus closes his talk by telling them he wins. He has overcome the world. He tells them the end of the story that he wins. He's overcome. Now, stay, stay with me here. Jesus told them that life was going to get difficult. And he was encouraging them with the truth that even though things get really hard and problems rock our world, God wins. And do you understand the full gravity of what this means? God wins. The devil is defeated in the end. God wins. Revelation 19.11, John says this. He sees he says, I saw in heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called the faithful and true. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dripped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He'll rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Read in Revelation 19 where he destroys the armies of Satan and he throws the false prophet and the beast into the lake of fire. Read Revelation 20 how he gets rid of Satan forever. Read Revelation 21 and see he creates a new heaven. He creates a new earth. God wins, and we know the end of the story. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Jesus is urging you on today with his own words, not to abandon the faith. I can promise you things will get rough. There will be trials, he said. But he tells, he tells us so we can have peace now here on the earth, as we journey to heaven, he has overcome the world. Maybe you're here and you are going through horrific trials and situations. Jesus doesn't want you to abandon your faith. Maybe you feel you have a, <laughs> you got a little strength, just a little strength left. Life has pelted you with one hit after another. A loved one dies, a horrible diagnosis maybe that you're living with, a marriage that has imploded against your wishes, a, a job that you were fired from and dissolved. Maybe you're the only follower of Jesus in your entire family. Jesus says, I know your strength is small, but dear ones, hold on. Don't abandon the faith. Don't walk away from my commands. Finish this race. We are in the home stretch, dear ones. We can see the finish line. We are so near to the coming of Christ. We can't abandon the faith and turn around. Jesus is coming soon. And maybe you're here and you realize you've been going through all the motions in your relationship with God, but it's time to renew your first love. For him today 
Maybe you've let the world's philosophies overshadow God's commands in your life. And you found yourself buying into compromise. And the Spirit's calling you back to His truth and to full obedience. Jesus gives the opportunity and the invitation to come back. Maybe you're here and you have no idea what I'm talking about in relationship with Jesus and what it means to put your trust in Him. It's very easy and very beautiful. Summed up in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting lives. So Jesus, the only son of God, came to show us the heart of God, the Father, and to die on the cross for our sins, paying our penalty, giving us the opportunity to be in right standing with God. So we acknowledge and receive his gift, and we start on a journey of obedience and living for God and not living for ourselves. So will you bow your heads, and we can pray in, in this moment. If you're here and you don't have a relationship with God, or maybe as the church we read about in Revelation, you've grown cold, and your relationship with God is non-existent. Oh, you, you believe in him, but there's no relationship. Well, we're going to pray together. Now's our opportunity. So whether you've never known him or whether you're coming back, if you just quietly in your heart, you pray this and you believe this in your heart, Jesus says you will be saved. If we believe in our heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, we make confession with our mouth. We are his children. So Lord, Father, we want you to forgive our sins. We want to be your children. We believe and how wonderful and compassionate you are that you plead and you show us how much you want us to have relationship with you. So, Father, we receive the sacrifice that you gave. We receive your sacrifice, Jesus, your blood for our sins. We can't get rid of the stains ourselves and the junk but Jesus, you can. And so, Jesus, we ask you to clean us, change our hearts, change our desires, help us to walk this road of obedience with you and to be different from this day forward. Write our name in your book of life, O oh, Jesus. And for those, Lord, that are distant and we've grown cold and we're going through the motions, Lord, we want to repent of that and we want to come back to you. Lord, things in our lives that aren't pleasing to you, Lord, we, we give it up to you. We want to be obedient to you, Holy Spirit, and surrender these things to you. And Lord, I pray for those that are beat up here this morning and they're weak and they're struggling. Lord, that you give them the strength to hold on, the assurance that you see them and they're going to get through this and there is going to be victory and Lord, we're so thankful you win. You win and help us, Lord, always, always keep our eyes on that truth and on that prize. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Church Online today. I pray that you were blessed by the service and by the word that was preached. If you received Christ today or you need prayer, please contact us. We would love to hear from you. We would love to pray with you. You can connect with us on social media, Facebook and Instagram at OC First Assembly. And also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can check out some of our past videos on there. There are lots of Bible studies and sermons and other videos that will be a blessing to you and in your life. We hope to see you next time. Take care and God bless.